Hello, History 101 and History 17A, welcome. I'm Derek Cowell, and this is um, uh, the topic of Native Americans, right? Uh, the first topic of the of the class. So at any rate, um, I hope you guys are doing well, and uh, just uh, want to make reference to a couple things before we begin. Uh, one is that you have an argumentative assignment up, and I ask that you please try to, uh, to, to choose one section and discern what the thesis is. Please cite the thesis for me. Uh, it's... it's uh, primary kind of MO the way that, that it is defended and um, and how evaluate how credible you believe that thesis is or is not and why okay uh, secondly uh, we have a, a, a standard test right of which I'm not particularly proud but I still it's one of many ways of evaluating your work and so one of them is by way of a multiple choice test uh, so let's see here. Number one, right? Ambiguity over origins and Asian ties of Native Americans. Number two, uh, those regions that the Europeans considered most civilized. Number three, commonalities amongst Native Americans that have formed, helped form uh, certain stereotypes for better and for worse. And of course, diversity amongst Native Americans. And um, and uh, we're going to get into also either this topic or when we do the Spaniards, uh, the stereotypical images. Uh, kind of um, conveyed uh, by the uh, the European chroniclers as they uh, they made note of the Native Americans. Okay, so jumping right in here, right? Firstly, right, we are limited in what we know about Native American history for a very simple reason: is there is a a paucity, there is a a, a lack, there's not too much uh, availability of primary sources. And remember, a primary source is a source from the time period in which you're studying. So it could be an atom, an object, right? Uh, cooking utensils and weapons and tools, etc. Uh, but also what we're looking for more specifically are written sources, right? Uh, and especially something that can be conveyed more than just, um, just a, a simple thought and so forth. And then arguably people would say that you need a syllabic um, uh, alphabet to do that, that pictographs or hieroglyphs can only go so far. But that's what we have, right? And so the famous stelae. Uh, a stella is a, is a monument, a stone monument uh, that has uh, pictographic writings on it. Not necessarily all pictographic. As we see with the Maya, they had a combination of a syllabic and pictographic uh, language. But at any rate, you see here, right? So for instance, you could see like the, the lines, right? A line is five years. <clears throat> uh, a dot above it is one year. So you see the, the, the line and <clears throat> three dots above it, that's eight years later, <clears throat> etc. cetera. So um, there's a, a gentleman named Michael Coe, C-O-E, and he helped uh, uh, illuminate to the world uh, the, the finishing of the Mayan code of us, quote, cracking it. And so at any rate, <clears throat> we feel rather confident now that we have cracked the code and can discern uh, many of the hieroglyphic writings. But of course, there's still plenty uh, that's a bit in the dark. So at any rate, um, uh, regarding this, right, with the, uh, the, the, the stelae, is, uh, so let's say you have, you know, um, uh, the number eight, like eight years later, then you have a, a person with uh, Tlaloc's war goggles on. Uh, that usually was uh, a Mayan, right? And he is stomping on a person with uh, the Quetzalcoatl's feathered headdress. And that usually was one of the, um, the Central Mexico's uh, tribes, right? So it's saying basically eight years later, the Maya triumphed over this, um, you know, Zapotec or other um, tribal uh, rival. So at any rate, um, <clears throat> let's see here. It gets really interesting with the uh, with the codices, right? Uh, you you could uh, find these in a nearby library at, at the university. Uh, it's very intriguing. You'll have pictures of day to day things, uh, cultural messages, how families uh, reared their children, etc. And you'll see uh, these pictographs of it, right? And then next to it, you have the old Castilian Spanish written message next to it, translating what that message conveyed. And then next to that, and usually now you could have uh, an English translation. <clears throat> Excuse me. But that comes from people like Bernardino de Sahagún, uh, priests and others, who would um, offer these schools whereby 
the young Aztec boys and, and others would be um, assimilated and convert to Catholic Christianity, learn the Castilian Spanish language, and they, as no, noble young men, they had been taught uh, to be literate in this hieroglyphic language. And so they would translate into Castilian Spanish what each of the pictographs can, meant to convey. Pretty cool, huh? So at any rate, but with North America, you don't have codices. You don't have stelae. Uh, instead, you're, you're largely just looking for, uh, you know, cave art and the famous round counts. And the round counts would just give a, uh, a depiction, I mean, literally a picture that symbolized a very key, pivotal, significant event of that single year. And not to mention it was in cycles. Uh, and so, because there was a cyclical worldview and astronomical view of the Native Americans and much of the uh, Great Plains and other areas where they found these uh, round counts. And so, hence, there's a sense of frustration that they don't have a linear history of this happened, then that happened, then that happened, etc., right, uh, in succession. And some frame of reference to the Western civilization uh, concept of time and barometers of time like the calendar on Christ's life <clears throat> to try to tie it to as they were able to arguably with the Aztec and Maya okay so then um, the the ties with Asia right uh, the Siberian and Mongolian area uh, supposedly you have um, the uh, two gentlemen in 1994 uh, who did an experiment with um, taking people's, uh, looking at their, their genotypes and their genetic markers, right? And what they found was supposedly they found some uh, commonalities amongst those who shared uh, supposedly uh, a somewhat homogenous ethnic background, which of course that in and of itself is a variable needs to be considered. How homogeneously Native American were those people who you know, engaged in that, uh, in that experiment. And I don't, I'm not talking about dishonesty. I'm talking about ignorance of, of every single generation, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, nevertheless, in this 1994, um, experiment, uh, they found that certain haplogroups and haplotypes that seem to have been, um, very rare, right? Uh, with tandem repeats, uh, sorry, this is speaking a foreign language to me. I, I'm, I'm not a hard science gentleman. But at any rate, uh, the Diego Allel, the GMAT, uh, with the, those that you see here on this slide, uh, very rare genetic markers and supposedly came up very commonly amongst both Asian and Native American um, uh, participants in this 1994 experiment. So is that a coincidence, right? So then um, cultural ties, right? Some literal words uh, tied to hunting and fishing uh, have been tied between Siberian region and the region of um, uh, particularly Alaska. Uh, but the problem is, right, is people look at this also and say, well, uh, you have syncretism, right? Syncretism or, or diffusion is when you have groups that are not from the same ethnic stock, if you will, or origin, but they just happen to run across each other through trade, warfare, etc., right? <clears throat> Migration. And in doing so, they borrow from each other uh, almost inevitably. So some people say that's not conclusive proof there that they have linguistic ties, that it could have been just that they, they hunted, they, they, they traded with each other. So, like I said, the point being, right, is science, and you see that number one in the argumentative assignment, is science could only go so far. Science could only go so far as far as creating a, uh, a confident, a confidence in, in knowing the, a, a narrative, uh, of being feeling confident of a narrative of Native American history. Okay, and then also morphology. Oh goodness, I I just want to barely touch this because I again I'm uh, too deep in waters beyond my intellectual capacity and and my uh, breadth of knowledge, and also because it just seems to me to have some uh, some relevant ties to today that 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 are akin to uh, to stereotyping, but morphology like the epicanthic fold of the eyelid. So anyway, I'm just going to drop that one right away. Uh, move on right away. 
So some of the date, some of the the dating methods they have, right? Uh, radiocarbon dating, right? Uh, radiocarbon dating is they they believe that they could find uh, by uh, by surmising like uranium and other elements they they decay the the um, they uh, the radiocarbon in them decays supposedly uh, at a predictable rate, right? And then it forms into other uh, elements. And so they look at how much carbon-14 uh, is found, how much of that, um, that orig or the original element is found, and how much of it has morphed into the other uh, type. So for instance, right, uh, let's see here. I thought I had it there. So potassium and uranium turning into argon, right, uh, in the process of radiocarbon deterioration. And so, um, but it, notice that takes for granted the assumption of substantive uniformitarianism, which means basically that the the rates at which things decay, the rates at which uh, certain uh, elements uh, just engage in, in activity and what whatever uh, whatever processes happen to uh, to morph or change the property of an element, right, uh, have stayed the same, and that is um, perhaps true. But the operative word there is perhaps. Uh, it, it's evidently arguable. Okay, so I'm deferring to uh, to uh, authors that are more uh, well read than I on this topic. Obviously, um, I'm looking at Brian Switek, uh, written in stone. I'm looking at uh, and then to try to have a balanced view. I looked at Refuting Evolution by Jonathan Sarfati. So at any rate, uh, let's see here. You have uh, stratigraphy. I noticed the picture at the bottom. Very interesting topic, right? Is that supposedly if you have certain rates that are predictable of erosion, right? Uh, and you have to look at the mineral composition, the the obviously the wind and water factors, etc., right? That supposedly, oftentimes, things sink at a, a somewhat predictable level or sort of uniform level in the same from the same time period. And they're largely going to hit the same proverbial hard pan, the same hard soil, hard elements that stop them in their tracks. Uh, and hence, when you uh, excavate items at the same depth, that you're very largely going to find things of the same mineral composition, that you're largely going to radiocarbon date them to about the same age and find that they were contemporaneous with each other, right? That they were from the same time period. And sometimes we've lucked out. Uh, here in the United States, they've literally have found uh, the bones of a mastodon uh, with a human-made, human-devised uh, obsidian or flint or chert-chipped uh, arrowhead, spearhead, uh, lodged into its ribcage. Uh, so obviously they, they look at evidence like that and say, okay, uh, man was contemporaneous with the megafauna, with the big animals, right, and hunted them. And so you have stratigraphy. Uh, climatology, epidemiology, uh, ice core sampling, and of course, looking at the ice core and the isotopes, etc. They could—that's where they have derived uh, their what they believe to be evidence for the ice ages, right? Uh, pollen analysis, molecular biology, etc. But some uh, sophisticated scientists uh, still contend that this is mere quote groping uh, in the midst of uh, of quite uh, quite of uh, a large amount of darkness that still remains uh, trying to play this game of inference the best that we can, right? So uh, so at any rate, so hence with number one, I try to make that argument, right? And remember, this is not necessarily my argument. As I put in the syllabus, it's an interesting thesis of a book that I've read, of a professor that I sat under, etc. And I think that it's, it's thought provocative. So please uh, read each of these very critically by all means, okay? So then, um, so for instance, C. Vance Haynes, <clears throat> for years and years, I remember I grew up on this thesis, uh, was that there's evidence that about, um, about 14,000 years ago, okay, uh, there, there were two uh, large ice sheets in the midst of our last, our latest, uh, I think it's, I believe it's called Wisconsin era ice age, uh, two uh, large ice sheets 
the Lorne Tide and, and oh, I apologize, I can't recall the name of the second one, but these two ice sheets and the Cordilleran, I think, they, uh, they supposedly, there's evidence of them receding back and forming the Great Lakes here in the U.S., etc., right? Uh, with the, the rocks caught in the, in the ice, etc., receding. But at any rate, there's evidence of an ice age and of these uh, glaciers covering with a narrow spot between them that didn't seem to be covered by a, a glacier. And so hence, right, with the, this ice sheet corridor or this walkway, there's the idea that about 13, 14,000 years ago, uh, humans largely through water displacement and the sinking of the Siberian Sea by, they believe, about 300 feet uh, because of the ice age, uh, that they went across the Beringian Strait, right, on land virtually, and went through the gap of those two large ice sheets. But the problem is, right, when they look for a carbon footprint, right, I jokingly call it like uh, Burger King wrappers, they look for evidence of humans having lived. As you may know, literally our feces can fossilize. Uh, there are plenty of things that, that can, can remain as evidence of human habitation, right? hunting, etc. Uh, very, very little evidence was found of human habitation in there. Now, does that disprove C. Vance Haynes' thesis? Of course not. Uh, but does it, does it throw it, does it fail to support it very convincingly? I think so. And so at any rate, in addition to that, right, then you have in 1997, right, at, uh, at Mont Verde, they found uh, artifacts that they carbon dated to 30,000 years old. Okay, well, so much for us not coming until 13,000 years ago, the Native Americans, that is, right? If they found things that can be rightfully dated to 30,000 years old. So at any rate, then other people began to say, well, maybe they came through the, by way of the Aleutian Islands, and they, they came by reed boats, that would have literally just become eviscerated by now and there'd be no evidence of them. So it, again, right, uh, science is doing its very best, uh, but it can only do so much with the little that is giving it, okay? So at any rate, they look at other places along the world, right, and just kind of a basis of comparison. Now we're getting into the idea of, of, of European uh, perspective, uh, European ethnocentrism. Remember, ethnocentrism is that you you consciously or subconsciously believe that that your culture uh, is superior to others, right? And you look at others and judge them by the basis of your own worldview, your own values, uh, etc. Right? And so the Nor the the Euro Americans who came and eventually conquered uh, the Americas, right? They oftentimes uh, gave uh, an evaluation, uh, an evaluation of how civilized, and I say that, I should say that like this in quotes, right, as a subjective term, uh, how civilized the Native Americans were in their estimation. So as frame of reference, right, you have by 3000 BC, right, along the Euphrates and the Tigris, uh, you have the uh, Mesopotamian city-states, etc., Hammurabi and his law codes, right, uh, the Babylonians, their astronomy, uh, the Egyptians. Uh, so let's see here. So just very briefly, right? The Indus Valley, uh, uh, Mohenjo-Daro, etc., 2,300 BC. Uh, the Yellow River, 4,000 BC. Okay. So now moving on to uh, the Americas, the scientists have done their best to try to categorize uh, chronologically Native American history. And this really ties into anthropology. This ties into global history. If you have a world history class and look at this, you should find the same classifications. So the Paleolithic era, right? Anywhere from 2 million to 10,000 years ago, that's evidence of the, of the Ice Age man, right? Uh, and, and the, and the post-Ice Age uh, is the formative or pre-classic era. And so uh, we're going to get into that soon. Let's see here. Uh, classic era, that's a little different. Uh, classic era is a little bit later in North America because they they try to use as a as a um, criterion for for using the term classic is supposedly reaching the zenith of your uh, civilization uh, accomplishments right 
And so uh, you could probably take a good guess if they're starting from about 150 to 900, that ties in well with the Mayan uh, uh, path of story of hegemony. Okay, so uh, the Maya are gonna be central to that notion of the classic or apex time of a Native American history. The post-classic 900 to 1521, and of course we have the most written about arguably on the Aztec uh, from that time period, and then the post-conquest era obviously, after the fall of Tenochtitlan, etc. So at any rate, let's see here. So uh, I'm gonna skip this one, but again, right, you're just, you're looking at, at ways by which scientists are trying to put, to put together, draw, attaching lines to connect these dots, right? So we have evidence, right, from the Folsom and Clovis, named after the cities where they were found, right, of, of human hunters of megafauna. I mean, look at some of this stuff. That middle one was actually a sloth, a giant sloth, uh, a mastodon and a woolly mammoth. We had a lion and a tiger. We had a camel and, a, and our own indigenous horse, uh, the saber-toothed tiger, of course, all of which had become extinct, right, by... Um, by the end of the um, the archaic period. Let's see here. They believe as early as 4000 BC that they found evidence for um, uh, cross hybridization of plants in, in, in Mexico, right? And so uh, it's amazing the type of analysis they can do now uh, with plants, lots of fancy words for it. Uh, but again, um, they believe, for instance, like with corn, right, that it may have involved teosinte, uh, T-E-O-S-I-N-T-E, -E, and teosinte, right, was a natural weed, and that it was it was grown together as a hybrid uh, with another plant uh, to form man-made uh, mice or corn, right? So at any rate, if you look what what um what uh the gentleman uh, Charles C. Mann says in 1491. He says, well, it's not fair to try to, first of all, it seems kind of arbitrary to decide, okay, how civilized were Native Americans uh, compared to Europeans? First of all, what, if they're not civilized enough, it that, that morally justifies dispossessing them of their land? Of course not, right, on an ethical standpoint. But then also just on a purely logical standpoint, why should we use Europeans criteria? Why shouldn't we use Native Americans criteria for what they consider to be sin qua non of, of civilization, right? And sadly, many people will kind of fatalistically say that we follow the European one because simply they won uh, for better and for worse. And so at any rate, very unfair. Uh, but nevertheless, right, uh, Charles C. Mann says that even if you do play that unfair, unethical game, Native Americans did pretty darn well, considering especially that they were isolated and that they did not have anyone to piggyback off of like the Europeans did, right? Because many of the great things, the wheel, riding, right? We, we got the wheel uh, from, from Mesopotamia. We got riding from the, uh, the, uh, the Sumerians, or I'm sorry, the uh, Phoenicians. And so, you know what I mean? We, we got plenty from other people. Uh, Gunpowder by, by through uh, the, some of the Muslim empires uh, fighting with China, uh, from China. And just the list goes on and on of manner by which Europeans kind of were able to uh, piggyback off of others uh, with their inventions. So at any rate, um, let's see here. Uh, Tiwanaku and down in the Beni, right, Bolivia, in Peru, uh, you're going to find evidence of raised fields, causeways, uh, fires, fishing weirs, canals, draining and irrigation and farming. And so by the way, right, <clears throat> it kind of stands without reason, but when you look at the criteria that the Europeans are using, <clears throat> it seems to be the following, right? Firstly, let's see if I could write this on here, if it'll let me do that. Let's see here, European criteria. So first of all, right, I would arguably say manipulation of the environment. They're looking to see if you have left your mark on the landscape. Do you engage in farming? Do you have any great monuments that you built, right, engineering-wise, etc.? cetera? Um, another one, of course, would be um, sedentary farming, right? 
because it's a notion going to anthropology and other uh, social sciences uh, claiming that there has been a predictable pattern of human cultural evolution. Uh, and of course, they, they say they started in hunter-gatherer status and they moved on to sedentary farming. They call it the, um, the Neolithic or New Stone Tool Revolution, right? And so are you engaged in sedimentary, sed, I'm sorry, sedentary farming, right? And then in doing so, have you created a complex society, right? And I probably should have put in quotations, complex, another somewhat relative term. But what they intend here, right, is mainly stratified and diversified. So by stratified, right, you have an upper and lower class, a middle class, etc., right? You have a hierarchy of some sort, as opposed to having just a simple um, hunter-gathering, egalitarian little group with a big man leading the rest of them. Uh, other than that, they're all on the same footing. Now, right, you have a uh, priestly class, right? Well, let's start with the, uh, the farming. You have farmers who grow the food, right? But now you have the temptation in growing food, and I'm going off of a, of a book that is called uh, Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari. And in his book Sapiens, right, he says, now you have the temptation of others to wait for you to do your farming and then come and, and grab what you have, have cultivated. So now you need uh, a standing army to defend your, your produce, right? And you may not have all willing hands. You likely do not have all willing hands to engage in the labor. So oftentimes you need to use some form of direct or indirect coercion to somewhat force them to do that. So you need some type of a hierarchy, right? Uh, and almost a police state. You need um, uh, armed forces. Also, right, the, the idea is, you know, centuries and millennia, actually, in some cases, millennia, before the scientific revolution and the enlightenment, etc., is uh, you're going to have people who uh, find themselves at the mercy of elements and variables beyond their control, right? Uh, and not that they didn't when they were hunter gatherers, they still, you know, they're, they're, but they're still evidently each case is different. But with the, the bison here in the U.S. and the deer and other um, fauna, uh, oftentimes there were predictable patterns to their migrations, etc. And so there were still prayers and placation to the gods uh, to, to make sure that all um, conditions were amenable to getting the hunt, right, and succeeding. But it seemed like it stepped up even more when you have to deal with the vagaries of weather and everything and, and pests uh, when you're trying to grow a crop. And you have more people in one spot dependent upon that crop, right? And so it can't go awry. You can't afford for it to, to go awry. So hence, right, you had a group of, of shaman and religious leaders who would engage in certain similar uh, traditions and, 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 and patterns of behavior and rituals uh, to try to placate the spirits, the gods, and to get the, the, the most out of uh, fertility, right, uh, of farming, etc. So you had a priestly class or a sacerdotal class. And so uh, then you also had um, merchants. If you had any ties to another village or city, uh, there was often a desire for trade, right? So you had the merchants as the middlemen. You have artisans, right, which are uh, skilled workers. And they would make everything from pots and practical things to carry things in to weapons and cooking utensils, etc., right? And not to mention what, what's become, what becomes very significant in Native American history as well as in other places is uh, our luxury goods, right? Uh, jewelry, textiles, clothing, etc., right? Because it's not just vanity and a sense of, uh, of it's, it's the, the prestige, right, that is coupled with power legitimacy. The idea is, right, if you have power over people, at any second, metaphorically, they can push you off of them. But when you have authority over them, they symbolically give up and say, you know what, you're my master, I accept it, right? And so hence, for a sense of authority, oftentimes Native American tribal leaders would insist that only they could have a monopoly on, um, on turquoise and mother of pearl and other fine jewelry and clothing and, and wear certain colors 
uh, from ochre and other things, natural elements that you could dye color uh, onto clothing and other things, right? Only they can wear the headdress, etc. So it became uh, symbolically and and thereby politically significant. Uh, this this tendency to create. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I drew a blank. Uh, non-necessary goods, luxuries. That's the word, luxuries. So at any rate, um, let's see here. So we've already done that. So the Olmec, they're oftentimes seen as like the, the mother culture by about 1800 BC. I want to speed this up. I don't want to just give uh, out, you might possibly die of boredom if I continued uh, tribe and region by region. So let me uh, try to, to uh, synthesize this a little better, okay? So when you look at the first places that tended to engage in uh, civilized attributes, if you will, right? You find most of them in Mesoamerica. So you find, right, evidence of these large ceremonial centers that become urban centers, that become cities. You have a stratified society of a priestly elite, an emperor of some sort or king, uh, his military elite, right? his farmers, his merchants, his artisans, etc. right? Uh, you have manipulation of the landscape. You have a little uh, Stonehenge by the Olmec, right? And their famous uh, head, uh, uh, head statues, right? You have, of course, irrigated farming uh, in the beginnings of the writing system and mathematics uh, from the Olmec, right? And it goes on to the Valley of Mexico uh, and, and, of course, the, uh, the Yucatan. So different cultures that they've named, right? Again, um, just evidence of, of great monuments. And, of course, in Mesoamerica, a very common theme is their astronomical expertise was incredible, absolutely incredible, uh, whereby their, their, um, the, the famous Mayan uh, uh, calendar was just amazing. It was more accurate than the Julian cal calendar was of the Spaniards who came here. Uh, it took account of leap year better. Um, just just amazing. As far as uh, predicting solar and lunar eclipses, uh, uh, celebrating the uh, solstice, I mean, they had things that were just amazing, whereby at the, right at the right day of the year, the sun would come right perfectly down onto the altar of a given um, temple, etc. Like the, the, the Camino de los Muertos, right? Um, in Teotihuacan. So at any rate, let's see here. So you get the point, right? And the stelae, uh, and the great monuments, the great pyramids, and of course with the um, with the, the Mexica or the Aztec, just amazing. They had two a two-tiered public school system. They had libraries. They had medical school and, and hospitals. Uh, they had uh, drawbridges limestone painted buildings, uh, incredibly adept uh, masonry, uh, once again tied to, uh, to great feats of engineering and knowledge of astronomy. Uh, they engaged in writing poetry and music. Uh, they had public baths and a library, even a zoo. So uh, let's see, just amazing, right? So moving on from there, and then I'm sorry, you see this uh, other I didn't finish my thought and I apologize, but not only do you have capacity for large complex settlements, but you have literary and artistic and scientific development, which seem to be kind of self-explanatory, right? I think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? That once you're no longer worried about feeding yourself, then you could ponder esoteric things and ontology, this, you know, your existence and why you're here and what life's about and engage in um, aesthetics, right? Or man-made, uh, man-devised notions of, um, of beauty and, and meaning, right? And enjoyment. Uh, technological innovation. And of course, number five, the Native Americans are gonna fail that uh, with religion, right? And so at any rate, uh, we're going to skip uh, South America, and we're going to look at, let's see here, the, um, the American regions. So firstly, right, chronologically, the Southwest, which is a bit um, anomalous because most of the time in history, right, the places where civilized societies uh, first spring up usually are the most amenable to uh, 
to sustaining a big population. So mainly by a big river, a very fertile soil, etc. right? But not so much in the Southwest, although it wasn't the same the weather uh, centuries and millennia past. It was not diametrically different. I, I've never read it to have ever been tropical or anything like that. Um, so at any rate, uh, the Hohokam by the time of Christ, and then after them you have the Mogollon and the Anasazi. Uh, their accomplishments were incredible uh, in the Southwest. I mean, take a look at this picture here. So farming, uh, the Hohokam had the largest irrigation system at their time to date in North America, right? Uh, buildings, neighborhoods, temples, the famous ball courts. They played a mysterious game with a blue rubber ball. Uh, pottery, textiles, art. Uh, look at the extensive trade. They had, uh, they had um, products from Lake Manitoba up in Canada. They had stuff from the Gulf of Mexico, uh, etc., right? So let's see here. Uh, the Anasazi also had uh, famously Chaco Canyon. Uh, look up Chaco Canyon, very impressive. These apartment-like communities, right? And the Mogollon as well. Uh, just incredible uh, with Chaco Canyon. The, the, again, their knowledge of astronomy, their street system, etc., right? Then moving up to, pardon me here, uh, to the mound cultures. The most famous of the mound cultures arguably was Cahokia. And before them, right, very mysterious are the the Adena right so you have it here so the Adena in the Ohio Valley right Indiana Ohio Illinois uh, West Virginia Georgia uh, they had um, a civilization very mysterious uh, it has been tied uh, chronologically and geographically uh, to contentions by the Mormon Church and in the the book uh, of Mormon uh, uh, people have have had uh, most of the traditions, however, are oral, which makes it very difficult to try to confirm um, uh, or refute, uh, but claims that the Adena were seen as a separate people. Uh, strangely, right, certain uh, uh, symbolic uh, anomalies of the Adena is one, they have burials of great leaders who were buried with great pomp and circumstance and lots of luxury goods, etc., uh, draped upon their persons. And they were well over six feet tall, uh, much taller than many of the people that they had been separated from in burial, right? You even have the swastika, the famous swastika writing. So, of course, some people say, oh, were they Indo-Europeans that somehow made it over here, etc.? Um, until there's further evidence of that, I would not go that far, but I'm just trying to whet your appetite into perhaps reading further into the Adena and studying them because it's a very, it's just a, an extreme curiosity that I think is just um, fascinating. So at any rate, right, uh, the famous 102 foot bird uh, symbol that is found from West Virginia up, to, up into Ohio. Uh, this blue and white stone bird of the exact same uh, proportions, right? So there's just so much still to try to discern uh, of the Adena, etc. But that's what you see there, like the burial mounds were huge, right? The famous was Cahokia in St. Louis, Missouri. And um, they would have uh, people buried with pomp and circumstances while others were buried separately. So evidence of a, a large population of thousands uh, of course, sedentary agriculture, uh, of course, complex society of multiple classes, etc. And this, uh, especially, uh, they say anywhere from like 700 through the time of the Crusades to like the 1300s, uh, was a heyday of many of the mound cultures there up and down the Mississippi. But as far as their material culture, of pottery, etc., and tools, and farming implements, and weapons, uh, they seem to have been very progressive and at the forefront of, 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 of human cultural evolution. The Eastern Woodland Natives, right? The Eastern Woodland Natives were known to uh, be uh, engaged uh, in about three different uh, uh, areas throughout a year, whereby they would either hunt, uh, harvest what they had grown or, or cultivated, right? Fished uh, and fought. And so with the Eastern Woodland Natives, right, you find evidence of them having great knowledge of the environment, uh, deliberate burning of forests, uh, 
uh, the use of, of multiple types, ways of, of, uh, of nourishing and providing fertili fertilization, fertilizer uh, for plant growth and crop growth, uh, of fishing, of course, and not to mention with the Iroquois, right, a very famous, sophisticated way of diplomacy that they had with other tribes, right? Where uh, just you, you read the Iroquois, it's a fascinating story uh, in which they supposedly had this, um, this uh, initial patriarchal figure who came in and told it, convinced them to start fighting, stop fighting with one another and to engage in a series of, um, of gift giving and speaking and also uh, recompense uh, to to keep war from happening between them, right? This League of Five and later Six Nations uh, up in mainly New York. They're also famous for the famous uh, roundhouses that they had, the longhouses, uh, oftentimes anywhere about 110 yards to smaller, uh, sometimes larger. Uh, multiple families of an extended family living together in each longhouse, uh, literally helping one another with raising of, or rearing of children, and uh, the daily duties of life, etc., and just very interesting case of the Iroquois. Uh, not to mention, their somewhat republican form of government, uh, democratically elected leaders, along with uh, wise uh, elder sages, including women, uh, matriarchs who figured very prominently uh, in Iroquois society. Just a very fascinating. I would highly recommend reading on that tribe um, uh, to anyone. Uh, the Great Plains. We think of Native Americans on horseback going after the buffalo. The horseback, they had to wait because they had become extinct, right? Uh, from the time of the megafauna, uh, they had become extinct and they had to wait for the Spaniards to come in 1540, uh, uh, Vasquez de Coronado, uh, to, to kind of reintroduce the horse to North America. So prior to that, and for even a century or so, at least a century or so after that, um, Native Americans were largely actually um, uh, sedentary farmers uh, along the Great Plains. So uh, oftentimes, in many cases, it was the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash, and they had kind of a, a, a great uh, synergistic effect on one another with these crops. Uh, they also uh, engaged in, in, in far-fetched trade, uh, sometimes as far as uh, the Dales in Idaho and other areas. Um, and so uh, you have that with the Great Plains, uh, the Muscogean, like the Chickasaw, the Choctaw, the Creek, etc. Right? Uh, the Muscogean were very, um, by the standards we're using, very quote civilized by the time of the Spaniards coming in the mid 1500s, De Soto and others. Right? Uh, these large confederacies with sophisticated diplomatic alliances and systems of tribute that that subordinate tribes paid to. To, uh, to more powerful tribes, etc. Uh, uh, an aristocratic aristocracy uh, that ruled by way of usually one autocratic ruler who could command labor, uh, raise and, and, and lead an army, etc. So the Muscogeans, right? We're gonna get more into specifics with these tribes, you guys, as they interact with the Euro-Americans throughout uh, the course of this, this uh, US history class in the semester, okay? And then the Northwestern, uh, we'll touch a little bit on that when we do um, uh, Oregon. Uh, so uh, just suffice it to say now, once again, the, um, the farming revolution had touched virtually everywhere in this country, uh, but certainly not by 3000 BC as it did in the Near East and Asia, etc. But to others, again, that, that's not fair. That's not fair, and it certainly doesn't justify conquest. Uh, so let's see here. In the West Coast, we'll get into that when we do the Spanish and their um, their entradas, right? Their their entrances uh, into Native American territory and claiming such with the famous uh, uh, Camino Real uh, up into the missions. But the Chumash were in the Santa Barbara area. So at any rate, let's go to uh, certain commonalities. Uh, so I believe we have covered ambiguity regarding trying to form a clear-cut narrative of Native American history, right? Unclearness, uh, cultural achievements by, uh, by, um, by Native American tribes, and I'll keep it general, okay? I'm not going to ask you very in-depth questions from one tribe to the next on your test. Uh, 
that would be a bit cruel because this is such a broad topic. Um, and then now commonalities, right? So let me, let's see here, my son. Uh, commonalities. So you see here, right? And this is no, one of the numbers you have on there, okay? Please note, right, again, they're not necessarily my theses. And in this thesis, I am not trying to convey the fact that Native Americans were primitive. Uh, I, I assure you that. I'm pointing to the fact is, right, is because of these cultural characteristics, they were unjustly stigmatized as primitive. Okay, big difference, in, in my mind at least. So at any rate, right, a chieftain form a political organization rather than a more sophisticated uh, multi-layered state. Okay, um, religion, pantheism, a belief that the, the great, there's a great spirit that connects all people and all things, right? So hence, uh, the great spirit is evident in the fish, in the deer, in the trees, in the rocks, in the rivers, in you and in myself, right? And so this pantheism, uh, it's connected to the Native Americans being stereotyped as holding nature as such a pristine and divine entity that they were unwilling to really make good use of nature and manipulate it well and to, and to subdue it, right? And you contrast that with a European worldview up through the Renaissance time period, whereby they take um, an interpretation of the book of Genesis from the Bible, right, in, in European history, and say basically that, that the, the Christian creator, the Christian God, made everything for man to be in charge of, right? Uh, the idea of stewardship, that man is in charge of all of it. He'll be held accountable for it, but he is in charge. Uh, he's in charge of it uh, to do as, as he, he deems necessary. So uh, pantheism was one thing. Uh, dualism. Dualism, right, is the notion that there is a, um, a duality, not only in, in, in notions of good versus evil. It's amazing how many Native American tribes had a good twin and an evil twin to personify that in their pantheon of gods, but also, right, a physical realm and a spiritual realm. And in the spiritual realm, right, the idea that you needed these shaman to try to placate the spirits to bring rain. Well, oftentimes, as like in the Northwest, or I'm sorry, the Southwest, the Pueblo natives, for instance, right, their religion was highly tied to fertility, right, uh, that they needed fertility in the crops and they needed fertility of the women to make babies. So hence, their religion revolved around um, sometimes literally sex. And so... Um, Clearly, when the Franciscan friars come in there, that, that is not going to be condoned <laughs> uh, to a, um, an early modern Spanish monk, right? And so uh, the idea of placating the gods and Mother Nature, etc., that was seen as unnecessary. And not to mention what I write in the paragraph, right, is that the notions of, of the biblical notions of monotheism, right? That there's only one God and that the God of the Bible claims to be such. And that any other worship of any other god is a mere delusion. That it, even further than that, um, there was textual evidence used in the early modern time period to suggest that all other gods literally were deliberately fabricated by demons, by fallen angels, to try to mislead people into worshiping the wrong gods. So at any rate, right, when the Europeans come in, they're not going to be okay with this. Um, with this, um, with these religious practices, they're going to look down upon them condescendingly, or even worse, they're going to demand that it be changed or, or uprooted, right? Uh, which they would call cultural genocide. Uh, moieties, right? Oftentimes, in the creation myths of the Native Americans, it was tied to a key to key pivotal animals in their ecosystem, and so hence it was a notion, right? With like when Polynesian culture, etc is whereby your family has the has a, a, a this um, mythical union with a particular deity who had taken the form of a particular animal and that animal whatever were the perceived characteristics of that animal right were to be the perceived characteristics of you and of your family as you were tied to that animal spirit if you will so for instance of course with mesoamerica uh the the jaguar right and his strength and power and tenacity, etc. And so your family could be tied to the jaguar um, god and deity. Uh, 
So at any rate, let's see here. Almost done, son. Uh, limited, if any, private property and capitalism. There wasn't a notion. It wasn't the same as private property as that was evolving at the end of the feudal period and the early modern period of Europe, where capitalism was kind of barbarically, uh, organically growing out of feudalism. So uh, you're going to have this uh, communication and misunderstanding whereby at times Native Americans will say, fine, you could have use of this land. And then, and of course, the Euro-Americans say, great, it's ours for good now. And there was an obvious misunderstanding between uh, what the Europeans used to call soakage or usage and actual proprietorship, owning it and it's yours forever, right? And so because of these differences, they're going to look at the Native Americans, arguably says this, this and by all means disagree, they're going to look at them unfairly and condescendingly as inferior. And oftentimes looking at them as inferior is going to lead to at least two, and I don't mean to create a false dilemma because there are other options here, but two at least very salient uh, reactions that, that are very widely seen in the history books. One is paternalism, right? Like, oh, you cute little natives, patting their heads, right, metaphorically, uh, let us take care of you. Let us teach you the right way. Uh, let us teach you how to... Um, how to live a more civilized life for your own good, of course, right? And then in addition to paternalism, as you could have outright um, uh, violence, oppression, exploitation, uh, where you just kind of demonize them and, and fight them off and, and either kill them off or try to culturally kill uh, their way of life, okay? And so... Uh, so hopefully I, I did okay on that. I hope you guys are doing well. The two stereotypical images, we pretty I pretty much hit those right there. But let me reiterate, as one was a very condescending, childlike, uh, innocent uh, stereotype of Native Americans. We're going to get into that immediately when we do the Spanish, when they came into the Caribbean, uh, particularly Columbus, right? And so uh, they call, there's a fancy word called prelapsarian innocence, as if they were like Adam and Eve, biblically, before the fall, when they were innocent and their minds were childlike, before they knew about sin and about vice uh, and, and about malice and deceit, etc., right? And then the second one is just that, it's just a bit of, on the other side of the spectrum, is that they are malicious, uh, devil-like, etc right that unknowingly they're being led by the devil and hence they have devil-like traits and characteristics and you also find that an evidence uh with the spanish in certain regions that we'll go over uh next week okay so i hope this helped please also look at the study guide i should have that on there look at my sample uh responses they're by no means the best that could be written. I, I read quite a few that were much better than the, than the ones I, I have down uh, just in the summer. I, I kind of wrote them quickly, but I just wanted to give you an idea of what I'm expecting, right? And again, just effort will get you 100% on the first assignment, okay? So please uh, keep watching your announcements. Take a look at the study guide. Make sure you do this by Sunday evening and you'll get 100%, okay? This argumentative uh, write-up. And you guys hang in there. You'll get used to my quirky style. It'll become a piece of cake. All right. All right. Have a good day. Bye-bye.